Yeah, I, it's not often that I'm around during the day to turn the television on. There's not a lot of daytime TV in my life, but every once in a while I'll find myself uh, at a hospital with, you know, at some surgery, someone's having a procedure done, and they'll have, a, uh, they'll have the TV on in the waiting room, and there are three things that you can bet that you'll find on the TV in the morning or in the afternoon. Soap operas. Some of them are the same ones that have been on for like 30 or 40 years. There's talk shows you've got all the way from the Jerry and Maury crowd all the way up to like Good Morning America and Dr. Phil. And, and there are the, the court TV shows. You know what I'm talking about? And, uh, and one day last week I found myself in, in the waiting room and I found myself being sucked into one of these shows. I just, it was just, you couldn't look away. Um, it was a, a new court show called Hot Judge or Hot Bench, something like that. And, and it was three judges because one judge isn't enough. So they have three judges up there and then after they hear all the facts and the case, then they go back and argue between each other about what the, what the ruling should be. And, and as the, the ending credits were, were rolling, I noticed that the show was produced by Judge Judy. Who we all remember from, from back in 90s fame. Now, I didn't watch Judge Judy very much at all, but growing up, I loved the People's Court with Judge Joseph Wapner presiding. Anybody else watch the People's Court? All right. And, and there's no shortage of these kind of shows on TV. You can watch Judge Joe Brown. You can watch Judge Mathis. You can watch Judge Alex. You can watch Judge Janine. You can watch Divorce Court if you need to get that fixed. But there... There's any, any time, any channel you can seemingly turn to during the day and find a court show on TV. And have you ever wondered why these are so popular? Because they're not well done usually. They're not well executed. But, but television has been filled with sitcoms and drama and these court shows for, for many years. In fact, two of the top six shows of all time, longest running shows, have been courtroom shows. Law and Order was on for 20 years. Most of the time in one of the top spots. And Law and Order Special Victims Unit has been on for 15 years. So 35 years of Law and Order we've had. And there's other shows. How many of you remember Perry Mason? A couple of you? One of my favorites growing up, Night Court. Any Night Court fans? <laughs> Matlock? Just had to turn in to see what was going on. And, and these had all had huge success. And, and one of the reasons why I think people love these court shows so much is because it gives you the ability to sit in the judge's seat. You're presented with all the facts. You get to determine whether someone's telling the truth or whether they're lying. And you get to form an opinion on the case but from what all was brought before you. And then you get to get the right at the end to agree or disagree with the judge, his decision, and what he thinks of the case. It's pretty cool sitting in the seat of the judge. But we like to sit in the seat of the judge for far more than just watching a daytime television show, don't we? We make judgments all the time whether we realize them or not. We make judgments when even the first time we meet people. We make a judgment on them about how they're dressed, how they speak, how they conduct themselves. We even make judgments on ourselves by comparing what, what we're like in some areas to what other people are like in some areas. We like to sit in the seat of the judge. But when we come across a scripture like the one that we have, we have today, and, and I would contend that this scripture had, may have become about the second most quoted scripture in all of all the Bible. Right behind John 3.16, you have Matthew 7, one, verse 1. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 6, but, but verse 1. And it's especially popular with those who are outside the church. Even they seem to know this, this, this verse. And so if you have your Bible, I want you to, to, to turn to Matthew 7. We're still in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is what it says. Do not judge or you too will be judged. How many of you have heard that? 
Mostly it's when you've tried to tell someone that they, they may be doing something wrong and they're quick to, to spit that back out at you. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under your, their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So, is it all right for us to judge people? No one wants to answer that question, do they? That's a trick, Pastor. So when we see someone who's doing something that goes against Scripture and goes against what we know is right, do we just stand and stay silent because we don't want to be seen as judgmental? How do we get a handle on a clear understanding of what Jesus is trying to teach here? Well, we need to take a deeper look at this Scripture and we need to search through the other Scriptures to get a full picture and a full context of what Jesus is getting at here. But before we do that, let's ask the Lord to bless our time together this morning. And Faith, would you open us in a word of prayer? Oh, dear Lord, we just thank you for being in your house today, Lord. And Father, what you're going to instill it within our hearts, Lord. Father, we just give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. Father, I just pray your blessing upon Pastor Doug as he gives the word, Lord God, that is coming directly from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, this week my sermon prep started pretty much the same as it, as it does every, every week. Uh, I, had, I started digging into the Greek and trying to find out the original meanings to, and the original words and phrases and, the, and the, the, the Greek language to gain a better understanding. And, and, and I read several commentaries and, 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 and what some of the greatest minds thought about this scripture. And, 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 and I thought about how we can relate to uh, the, the judging of that we do sometimes to the, the TV shows that are on during the day, but I was stuck. I was, I was, I was having trouble coming up with the, the meat of where we wanted to go today. And, and because there's so many different voices out there. Uh, trying to, to speak in, and so I, I, I started to pray for the Lord to reveal what He wanted me to say, and so I thought in, in that moment, Let, let's go for a run on the trail, because, you know, it's pretty peaceful, it's pretty calm, if there's any place that you can hear from the Lord, that's it. And so, when I was on the trail, I, I passed three people on my run that day, I ran from back behind the fun bank to out pull the park and back. So I had a long trip, but there was only, it was so hot that day, there was only three people on that, that whole stretch of trail. And the, the first person was a boy, and I'm guessing he was about nine or ten years old. He was just outside of town, and I began to instantly wonder if his parents knew where he was. And I began to wonder, well, if they do know where he is, is he old enough to be out here by himself? I don't think I'd let my child ride, you know, by himself in the woods. The second person I came into contact was a, was a teenage girl, about 13 or 14, and, and she, we were, I was just past Fish Basket Hill, and she was wearing a New Bethlehem Little League shirt. And so I thought, well, it's about time to, for the Little League games to, 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 to start to get ready. So I thought maybe her parents are at work, and, and so she has to ride her bike in, and she's going in for a game. And, and, and that was flowing through my mind. The last individual I passed was also on a bike, and... He was a gentleman in his late 40s, early 50s, and he appeared to have a really hard life. His clothes were, were all tattered and stained. He was missing quite a few teeth, and, and I began to wonder, man, what, what would bring someone to be out at that age on a bike? Was he a victim of extreme poverty and not able to afford a car? Had he been arrested of a drinking problem and lost his ability to drive? And at that point, God sent a thunderbolt to me. What I had just been doing while asking to be prepared about a, a, a sermon on not judging was judging these individuals before I knew a thing about them. I had condemned two sets of parents and one individual, one individual that day, before even knowing a thing about them. 
And I'm probably guilty of doing that more than I know. But because I had said a prayer before, I think that's when God was opening my eyes. And I'm sure that he sent those people because normally when I pass three people on the trail, I know every one of them. That day, I didn't know a single one of them. I had not met any of them before. Here's what our scripture says again. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged with the measure you use. It will be measured to you. So let's unpack. The Greek word here translated as judge is the word krino. And when you look at the word krino, it literally means I judge, I decide, or I think good or bad of something. Now this is a word that's used in both court settings and in private setting. And it's the, where the person is, is seeking to separate or distinguish or, or come to a choice about something. But you know what this word also means? This word also means I condemn. So if we just take this on face value as many people do, it means that we can't come to a decision or a choice about anything without being in trouble and being judgmental. After all, anytime we judge something or someone, we're breaking this command on the surface. So we must look at this scripture through the lens of all of the other scriptures. Here are just a few. In John 7, verses 23 through 24, it says this. Now if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, from which you have heard and is coming, and even now is already in the world. So what we can do from our verse this morning and from these verses that I just read you is we can come up with a, a complete framework instead of a, just a general statement where we can say, is it all right for me to judge in this case? And so the first thing is, if we're judging someone on our own standards and on our own set of rules and on our own set of traditions, we are in the wrong. We're only to judge them based on God's set of standards. And based on God's laws. And based on His rules. You see, God is the one who is set up as the judge. We are not set up as the judge until later. And we get to sit and judge those who, by the side of Jesus. But for the time being, Jesus and God are the judge. So when we say, I judge or I decide what is right and what is wrong, we are in the wrong. Instead, it should be God says it is wrong, or God is, is making this judgment. Secondly, if we're judging people based only on their appearance, we are in the wrong. If we're judging them based on what we can see on the surface, we are judging incorrectly. This is the, the same mistake, and I'm not going to... to a, lot of, a lot of preachers like to say, well, I made this mistake. Listen, I've sinned this week. Let's just call it what it is. When you make a judgment about someone without even knowing anything about them, that is sin. And so my sin this week was I made a judgment based on outward appearances. And when we do that, we are not only making a mistake, but we are in sin. Judging based only on outward appearance is always wrong. Because when God, God has this ability to see into a person's heart that we don't have the ability to do. Any of you see into a person's heart? No? Because God judges based on your heart and not on your appearance. 
And, and, and so he is able to, to make a more clear decision. He knows more about the person than we do. So we must not judge based only on outward appearance. Thirdly, we're told that we're to leave the judgment of those outside the church to God. But we're to judge those who are inside the church. Now, this is not meaning that we need to condemn everybody, you know, turn to the person on your right and condemn them for being a sinner. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying when you see them doing something outside of God's law or God's rule, you turn to them in love saying, listen, I want to help you. This is this what you're doing is not right according to God. And so we hold up our brothers and sisters in love because that's our responsibility. When you see someone in church who's doing something wrong according to God's word, it's our duty to lovingly go to them and correct them. And finally, we must always use our judgment when it comes to those who are teaching the word of God. When you have to hear someone who is speaking the words of God and they, they claim to be a, a teacher or a pastor, you're always to put those words to the test. You're always to, to, to put what they say up against the scriptures and, and make a judgment about whether they are, they are teaching the word or whether they are a false teacher. And when they pass the test of our judgment, then we allow them into our lives and we allow their words to take root. If I can sum up these four things with one statement, it's this. You have to use your judgment when it comes to judging others. You see, that's where this framework comes in. If you, if you, if you think about the, 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 just this scripture, we, we like the generalized statement, do not judge. Okay, so I'm never going to make a judgment about anything. Now, you know in marriage that doesn't work. When, when your wife says, how do I look in this? Stun silence is not an option. Because a woman will always pick the worst possible answer. Is that correct? So you have to make a framework. You have to know this. You have to know the scripture. You cannot just remain silent. You have to judge where you are allowed to judge and not judge where you're not allowed to judge. We can't just put a blanket statement over judgment. Second thing that I see from this scripture. Your first and foremost judgment must be to judge yourself before you begin to look at anyone else. Our scripture goes on to say this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, we're in the throes of haymaking season. How many of you like haymaking season? No one likes any making season. You must run the track. <laughs> you know, I, I have some great memories of, of growing up in the summertime on my grandparents' farm. And, and most of the memories are good, but the memories of putting in hay have been repressed for years and years and years. Because it's like 300 degrees and you never, you never quite get finished. And, and I remember one time just getting a little piece of, of the chaff of the hay in my eye. And we just couldn't find it anywhere. It was so small. And, it, and, and it's not life-threatening, but my eye watered all through the night. And, and, and it was so irritating to have something so small in your eye. This is kind of what Jesus is getting at. All of the time we like to point out the little things and the little sins that irritate us about someone else. They don't do this right, or they don't follow this in the same tradition the way that I do. And, and, and we allow this little irritation in others to fester in us and, and, and causes us, us harm. But is the little speck of sawdust life-threatening in the other person? No. It might be irritating to us, but it's not life-threatening. In the meantime, some of us are running around with a plank. Now, the word plank doesn't do this justice. This, this, this word in the Greek is talking about a whole beam 
sticking out of your eye. This would be a, something used to, to create a foundation for a house. Now, if you've got a log the size that can be used as a foundation of your house sticking in your eye, is that life-threatening? You better believe it. In fact, I don't know how you're still upright. But Jesus is saying, take care of your own tree. Take care of your own being. Take care of your own sin first. Because it's so very dangerous and because it blinds you to really see. What is this getting at? Let me put it this way. In college, I once knew a man who became upset because another believer had a beer or a glass of wine every once in a while. Now, I don't know what your views on this are, but it doesn't say in the scripture you cannot have beer, you cannot have wine. It says don't get drunk. And he was not a drunkard. And he enjoyed a glass of beer or a glass of wine every once in a while. So man number one felt it was his responsibility to go up and condemn man number two who, who about his drinking of a beer or wine. And it turns out later that man number one, who was so upset about this, was addicted to pornography in his own life. Now, talk about the beam telling the speck. This, this is the kind of thing that, that, that we're talking about. And, and he failed to recognize his own sinful behavior, and it was blinding him to, to the fact that he needed to look at his own faults. We point to the faults in others, but it's our duty to find our own faults first. Listen to these scriptures. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13 says this, Therefore, my dear friends, if you as always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. With fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in according to fulfill his good purposes. We're to, to look at our own salvation, our own sin first. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and 6 says this. Examine yourself or test yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or the bad. You see, when you get to heaven someday and you're standing before Jesus and Jesus begins to point out all of the things that you've done wrong, He's not going to take, well, so and so had this wrong in their lives. It's not an acceptable response. You're to be concerned about you first. About getting the sin out of your life. We need to stop comparing and contrasting ourselves with others and put our, our faith up against the measuring stick of Jesus Christ. Are we as good as He is? Have we gotten rid of as much sin as Jesus got rid of? Because we're going to have to give an account before the Lord about ourselves and our action and no one else. Therefore, we must be quick to judge ourselves before anything or anyone else. Putting ourselves to the test. You know, when we judge someone, we're often accused of being hypocrites. You know what that means? Quite literally, it's a person who was wearing a mask claiming to be a Christian, but when in fact they're not. If we continue to have these sins in our lives and, and these beams sticking out of our heads, when they make that accusation against us, they'll be correct. Take care of your own house first. And finally, you must use your judgment when choosing who to get who you share the gospel with. Here's what our scripture says. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is one of the weirdest verses in all the scripture. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. And, and here's what it boils down to. We have this precious jewel, this, this pearl, this, this, this gift that is given to us, which is the gospel message. 
And, and there are people in this world who are not ready to hear the word of God. Amen? They're, they're just not in that place. And so uh, if you have a, a, a jewel and there's an untrusty person in front of you, would you t t turn and hand them the jewel? No, what are they going to do? At the first moment, they're going to take it and they're going to, to, to run with it and they're going to destroy it. And so that's what it's saying. You have this joy that you've given, so use your judgment in who you give it out to. This is hard for me because I, I, I'm a pastor. I want to believe that every person is in the place where they want to hear the Word of God. But from experience, I know this isn't the case. And, and, and these kind of, kind of people, they're in churches, they're outside of churches, but we cannot allow them to take up the majority of our time. We pray for them. We think about them. We move on them. There are so many people who are ready to hear the gospel. The scripture said the fields are white with the harvest. There are so many people that, that need the gospel. And so we need to use our sound judgment and take the pearl of the gospel to someone who's ready to receive it. You know, we, we love our dogs today. Our dog's going to be turning 12 next month. We've had him for... It seems like forever, you know. He's he's part of the family. We had him four years before we had children. So, and and all, all he does is is go from whatever room I'm in to whatever room I go to and lay down on the floor and sleep. That's pretty much his day. And every once in a while, he decides I'm hungry and he gets up and goes and eats and comes back and lay down. We love our dogs today, but that wasn't the case back in Bible times. Dogs were, were, weren't something that you kept as a pet. Dogs roamed the streets and they stole from people and they stole your food and they stole your items and they, they would drag them away. In fact, they were called mooch pooches uh, back in the day because they, they just, they mooched off of people and they never, they took but they never gave back. We need to be on the lookout for those who are being mooch pooches with the gospel, who are never looking to give anything back and they're always looking to take. That's how you can t discern sometimes about whether they are ready to receive the word of God. Their words, their actions are always looking to take from you and never to give. So we got a crash course on judgment this morning. And where it is our place and where it is not our place, we need to remember that first and foremost, we need to use our judgment on ourselves and on our actions and on our words before we even start to point a finger at anyone else. Also, we need to, to remember, leave the judgment of those outside of the church to God. And when we judge those inside the church, that we use love and not condemnation. We need to remember that, that we cannot judge on mere appearance. We must get to know someone and, and, and get a glimpse into their heart first. And we also need to use our judgment to be to look on, be on the lookout for false teachers and, and people who are just trying to steal the, the pearl of the gospel. You see, judgment is not always bad. In fact, it's sometimes necessary. But we must know and we must have the scriptures in our hearts so that we can have that framework where we know whether it's our place to make a judgment or whether it's not. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And Lord, I pray for that truth on the subject of judgment to sink down deep into our hearts so that we may know our place when it comes to judging others. Father God, I pray your forgiveness for times when we've held others in judgment and Lord, that you would just uh, give us a fresh start and a fresh understanding on what do not judge is really all about. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You know, I was thinking this week, 
about that verse, about where it says that it's God's job to judge those outside the church. And his whole attitude is, they can come to me just as they are. When we look at someone and we look at their outward appearance and we look at, at what we can see on the outside, many times we think we need to clean them up before they can come to God. But he just calls out, come as you are.
Go out with that message this week. You are empowered and dismissed in that. Come as you are. Amen.